There you go. Okay, there you go, John. I'll introduce myself. <laughs> so, um, you have heard a lot about my family and know very different bits and pieces of them. It's really very large. Um, <laughs> and many of them knew um, my parents. Uh, the top three on the left are the Cornell contingent, my parents and my youngest brother. The rest of us are in, in chronological order. And then there are many Ham Hamiltonians at Trinity and three of, uh, three of my sisters and my father are from Hamilton as well. So that's us um, back in 1965. Um, <laughs> and I will say that they've all gone off to do remarkable things. Um, and the, uh, my mother's monster was who can good. So all have gone out and done a wide variety of things over time, but that's where we were then. So is that enough of an in introduction? <laughs> I can't see the names. Can you just read all the names going down the list of who's seated? Oh, there are no names. <laughs> I just oh. put their, oh, their credentials. Sorry. Oh, okay. So do you, I can tell you who they are. I do. Yeah. <laughs> Unlike mother, I remember their names. Okay. It goes W. Ben, Ellen, Peter, squish in between there. Here's the baby. Michael, Sherwood, the judge and vessel, me, uh, Sarah, uh, who's now living in England, Jeffrey, uh, who's in D.C., Candy, who's in Seattle, Cindy, who's in New Jersey, actually former CFO of the Dodge Foundation, um, and where were we, Cindy, Matthew, um, an attorney um, uh, taking a break, and then Jill, who is a... Uh, she, she's a Marabito, Jill Marabito. Um, she's now at a uh, major gifts fundraiser for, I can never remember if it's Cor uh, Cortland or Oneonta. So, so this <laughs> geography after handwriting is my second worst subject. So, so that's everybody. Oops. And now, how do I get back to my, Carl, how do I get back to the first slide? Like this? <laughs> <laughs> Making a movie? Okay. All right. So today um, I've been asked to follow on with what um, Darlene talked about last week was Trinity members who were in World War II. So this looks at Broome County com uh, companies that were part of World War II and specifically those that earned uh, an World War II E for Excellent word, uh, Award for Production. It was given both by the Army and the Navy. And to make this not so... I thought we'll take a look at it from a detective who was a, a, a Binghamton photographer in World War II and see, um, take a look at the various things that were made here that he would have used or might have been in the background. And on the left-hand side are things that he would have been directly, he would have used directly. Ansco Film, a park by Dryback, which was a, a company here in town. Uh, and we'll talk more about these later. A, a tent from Eureka Tent and Awning. Uh, Ozolid made really big paper that then the government printed maps on. So in Johnson City, they had a, one of the largest paper printing or uh, paper coating machines in the United States. And being at that point originally owned by Agvet was known as Big Bertha. A very sure. Okay, he would have worn EJ boots, which we can pass around, <laughs> or a boot we can pass around. Um, possibly, and and we'll go through these companies as we go on. Possibly, um, I'm not sure he was in the army, but whether or not he was part of the Air Corps, or he must have been flown somewhere. He must have been in his career. Um, Remington Rand, uh, which became the GE, became the BAE site in Johnson City, uh, was a vision of the propellers for Remy, uh, the government. Stow Manufacturing made cables that controlled, um, controlled air, aircraft. And made a lot of things, which we'll see, but specifically what it as what might have used would have been one of the electric typewriters that followed through. E.H. Uh, e. Titchener, that they would use for people who were hurt. And then Link Beer Pianos um, were a recreation every had a player piano in their rec room and probably some in 
the uh, different camps, but it was also thought to be the basis for Hedy Lamarr's approach to decoding um, ciphers. And the reason that, that works is instead of telling people what the key for the day is, the, the encryption key, you just give them the name of a song that they play on the player piano and they know what line to use to find um, what the code, the key to the code would be. So that's kind of an overview of how Binghamton and Broome County um, really support the, the, yeah. When did they start using electric typewriters? Um, 1933. 33. Okay. Uh, well, 1933, IBM bought a company called Electromatic from Rochester. Um, so, yes. And then the first thing they did was add their logo. The next, so same typewriters at Electromatic IBM. And then the next is that they took off the Electromatic logo. So it's a typewriter, it just says IBM, same typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we have all three of them in the collection. You should um, encourage all of you to stop by and see um, what's up. This is kind of a highlight of a, a display that we put together for the Rod Serling event in September. Because Rod Serling was a paratrooper in the Philippines in World War II. A second famous paratrooper from here was Johnny Hart, um, the cartoonist. But that was the Korean War. He was a little younger. Okay, so here we go. So we'll, we'll do the boring part now and then we'll go back. So, <laughs> okay, here are the companies that official, won, officially won the Army, Na Army Navy E Award. Um, we talked about most of them just now. Um, and Union Forge and uh, Endicott made <coughs> bayonets for, okay. Um, these are companies that did things for World War II but did not win an Army Navy Ian Award. And Bonnie Silk Manufacturing on the east side of Binghamton is said to have made parachutes. And there's really no documentation of that under other than people say, if anyone wants to help us find out what happened to Bonnie Silk in World War II, that would be a huge, um, a huge help to all of us. You might get a kick out of this, two of the most famous companies that you would have thought would have Gotten an Army Navy E Award did not. So Endicott Johnson, who made lots and lots of shoes, which we just passed around, um, they were denied uh, or they were not approved for an Army Navy E Award because of their attendance. Their employees didn't meet the criteria of getting to work on time or often enough. They had too much absenteeism. So no. <laughs> um, Link Aviation is a really big surprise, and I can't explain that. And I'll show you some things some documents um, in a minute about why they maybe felt they had been honored elsewise. Um, I don't know. And it, it's also possible that um, aviation was too new and the Army and the Navy during the World War II era, the Army and the Navy were fighting about who should fly airplanes. There was an Army Air Corps which was not <laughs> the Air Force. So it could have been that there was a challenge there. So, and we see in the documentation that there are the same document first has got an A number and then an N number, and then it's got an A slash N number. So I'm staying out of that one. Phillips Foundry in Binghamton, it's not clear to me that they were, um, that they did not get any award, but they, he, um, they did cast aluminum uh, and then Union Forge and Endicott did bayonets. Okay, so just really quickly, here's some other upstate New York EU Award winners, including Bendix Aviation, I mean, Elmira Cor uh, Carrier in Syracuse, Corning Glass, Morse Chain and Ithaca built the belts for the tanks, the, the, the equivalent of a metal tire that would go around. Um, Norwich Pharmaceutical, um, and then Fairchild Cameron Instrument Company made both uh, high-end, um, very large cameras as well as airplanes to fly them with. Okay, so here we go back to Ed and we'll kind of go through and see what it was that he did, not necessarily in that order. This is the, an overview of what was the plant in Johnson City. It was built in 1942 for Remington Rand to build propellers and pumps. So if anyone knows there's a propeller hub, 
Um, it doesn't, <laughs> we would really like one because that's a really sophisticated analog computer uh, because it has to tell the, the things where to go. But we, nobody seems to have one. So, oops, next slide. Uh, in the black and white slide on the right, there's a center piece. It's a little kind of a dome kind of thing. That's what we're missing. So we have a set of propellers from a flying fortress, but without the head. And that's A, important from a technology perspective, and B, that's the contribution that Johnson City made. Um, that went on to later on, uh, and this started in Schenectady, but later on came to Johnson City. This is a, a leading edge gyroscope for navigation and um, became extremely important in the, in the Vietnam War. It's what made them the pilots be able to not get killed when they were flying the F fours, particularly. So, so, okay, all right. Stowe Manufacturing on she Shear Street, and I believe the Stowe family um, is a member or was a member. The original, I'm not going to come up with their name now. Um, the Hotchkiss. Yeah, the Hotchkiss. They they were owners of Stowe, right? Right. Okay, so this is not only Binghamton, but it's a, it's a Trinity family, um, and they build something which is called a flexible shaft. If you make a, a if you make a whip out of metal instead of leather, you can you get the ability to change the direction of force. Dentists use it all the time, and they go. <laughs> That's a flexible shaft. You break on your computer on your bicycle pushing this way the cable goes down and then the brakes go in right two different directions this flexible shaft if anyone had if you pushed me and said you could only have one invention from central new york state it would be the flexible shaft because there's so many things you cannot do with the flexible without a flexible shaft speed in your car um uh pilot your your ship and these are some of the things they're showing that were done um, for aircraft in World War II. Okay. Another um, one that we don't typically think of, and also a Kennedy family, the Grady family owned Dryback Corporation. And their slogan was, dry back, the A-C-K, or your money back. <laughs> and um, we can pass this around. This is one of a, uh, this is a pilot. So now we're taking perspective of pilot. This is a pilot outfit. I'm sorry, that's not the right word, but it's a, this is what a pilot would have worn. This is Binghamton, as you can see. Um, and this is a flight jacket, which we don't own. Flight jackets, if we were to something like a flight jacket today, that would be $1,000 for a dry back flight jacket. So we were lucky to acquire this early on. I'm happy to pass it around, but, and there's another escape map in the pocket. So oh, okay. there you go. Um, okay, uh, Bonnie Silk, we talked about parachutes. We do not know. <laughs> We've not seen one There's no documentation that they were actually military contractors, but it's a great story and it would be really terrific. Where okay. is Bonnie Silk located on the east? Um, I'm going to say Weller Street. There's a... <laughs> I'll show you on a map. If you go to the main street on the east side, Robinson, Robinson and it's off, there's a church. <laughs> you go past the, the grocery store and then beyond there, there's a church. Oh. It's right in that neighborhood there. Okay, I know where it is. Okay, yep. good. So help us. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually, I gave a talk at the uh, <clears throat> at that church <laughs> and that's where they said, oh, we built, we yep. made parachutes in World War II. So, okay, great. Okay. Um, we talked about Andrew Hatt Johnson not uh, winning, but they did do a lot. And this gives you a sense. Here's a list of the retired workers that were honored at a 1948 retiree dinner. Um, and then the committee that did this. So this gives us a list of names that we can check to see if they're eternity or if they're still, if they're still available. Um, this one is one we don't think of as being part of the war, but it's Eureka Tent Nani. Um, and there they are putting it together. I know that this is a Trinity family. This company still exists today. They're making military tents. They're making recreational tents. And to, to, to follow a little bit of what happened next, 
is they were the ones who came up with an post-World War II, they started making tents out of nylon, and they also started using the flexible poles that have a, and don't ask me how they make them, but <laughs> they work. <laughs> um, anyway, so here, um, and you'll see that it's both women and men, and on the wall to the far right, you'll see it says every minute, and the, the final part of that sign is every minute counts. That was the big marketing or incentive that was um, put on in there. So this is another company we don't necessarily think about war. This is E.H. Tishner, and I'm also pretty convinced these are Trinity family, if not the Tishners, the next generations. Um, but this is um, their specialty for which they won the award is a lightweight wire splint. So to replace the it lighter and this, and you can see the person puts his foot in there, it gets wrapped in bandages before, and then you're good to go. So it was considered a model of efficiency um, for them. While we're on the subject of health, uh, we're gonna move over to another company here. It's ANSCO that did x-ray films. So x-ray films is really important are really important. We don't think of ANSCO as doing that, but they were considered one of the best um, X-ray film producers. There's a photograph, um, a color photograph using ANSCO film. It printed in a magazine in the 1940s, and you'll see the guy's got his legs wrapped up, but he's also um, that's color film. And there's the equivalent. I'm going to start passing this around now. This is for IBM, but every company got them. Um, when the, there was a big E award ceremony, big flag for the company, everyone got pins, and then there was a quite an extensive um, get get together. So pass it around. That's for IBM Endicott, but every every one of the companies had one. So let's do a little bit of data before we go. Um, this is a report from the 1943 Industry Advisory Council. It looks at the film requirements that are projected um, for 1943. And the second column of data are for AGFA ANSCO, and the rest are total. First column is total, then AGFA, DuPont, Eastman, Kodak, and then others. And what you can see is, is that AGFA was, ANSCO was not one of the largest producers, but neither were they nothing. In some cases, they were um, producing 15 in some cases, they were producing 15 and 20 percent of the film of that category. Oh, thank you. Um, and the middle, the middle line that's the most open is the X-ray line, and you can see there that they produced about 15 percent of the X-ray film used in World War II. So it uh, was really quite remarkable. Um, <laughs> politics get very complicated around AGFA and ANSCO in World War II because of its German ownership and because of, it wasn't just the film that they were concerned about. It was the other things that General Aniline and Film had bought. For example, there was a Henry Ford family member on the board of directors, so bunches of Ford shares, United States Steel. They were in the process of negotiating a purchase of 100,000 shares of Alcoa aluminum when the federal government said, okay, that's enough. We're, no, we're going to take you over. So um, the company was run by the Office of Alien Property as part of the uh, Justice Department from 1941 until 1965. Um, and the 65, okay, well, look at, ask me later about the 65, 1965, if we have time. But what's fascinating to see, I think, is that here they are, it's German, it's in the middle of the war, and they're marketing themselves as Agfa Ansco, 100 years of American photography, <laughs> as if they weren't giving up. Um, so, and this gives you, this is a timeline or a sequence of the, in her right is when they got taken over by the Justice Department, their colors went red, white, and blue. <laughs> Patriotic. Um, uh, 
they became very patriotic in, in their um, packaging. Let's pass this around. That one you can throw. Um, <laughs> Okay, so to talk a little bit about people, we don't have to name these people, but this is the uh, chemists who um, were working in 1942. Um, quickly, ANSCO is a remarkable company. They never had more than 50 chemists, but they outpaced Kodak in terms of uh, advan photo advances in photochemistry in the 20th century in almost every case. And um, really remarkable people in World War II. I think we're going to see this in a minute, so I'll tell you that. Okay. Um, in World War II, they came up with the first develop it yourself color film. And that's really important if you're going to do spying because you don't want to have to take the picture, send it to Binghamton or Tester, and wait till it comes back to the Philippines <laughs> to, to find out who it was who was going to attack you the next day. So that was really. And, yeah. and, uh, Kodak did not come up with that until three or four years after the war was over. So this is um, pretty important. The Trinity Zone uh, Stu Purdy might be in that picture. Okay, well, we can take a look. There you go. If, if anybody, we we're happy to share this. If anybody can, can help us decode this, this would be great. Here are the women who are in spec, um, the film for flaws. And one of my favorite photochemists said, he really did not like to go into the, the rooms because as he would go down the aisle, the women would pinch him. So, <laughs> I remember. Okay, here's an, uh, another group of chemists, which we can probably recognize some of them. So also uh, Wilbur Dodge's father was an important person in World War II and SCO, important enough that he had unlimited gas rations to, to take his motorcycle from the lake, from Quaker Lake, that's where he lived, Quaker Lake, to the plant during World War II. So it's really, uh, that's a, a testament to um, a fair amount of importance and talent. So this is how the film was used. The big camera there is a Fairchild Aviation camera from Rochester. They're um, putting together composite maps of the photographs for they, so they can see um, what they're doing. Um, and this, this is Edward Dyke, Edward Dyke and standing on the bottom. He was a, a photographer in World War II, along with Ed Aswad. Um, but there he is, uh, risking his life to take photographs. Um, and so everybody became involved. And just to go forward a little bit, um, the next one of the things they pioneered was high speed color film, and they made a big difference. The crisis. It was the, it was the color films from ANSCO that convinced the UN that in fact the Russians had uh, missiles here. And this is a, a missile site, and please don't ask me to describe it. Apparently, those things sticking out are missiles. <laughs> okay. All right. So, but to go um, to continue on, what happened at the home front in World War II is um, they were still promoting film, and they really had some pretty spectacular papers and chemistry to do this. Um, and this is a photograph of, I didn't dare bring it. This is the develop it yourself color film and the developing outfit, which was found. There's a note there that says it was found in someone's basement in 20 in it came. It was made in June, 1942. Wait a minute. Yes. Um, and we're lucky to have it when Ed Aswad was leaving. He, we were able to acquire it from his collection. So we're thrilled. Um, okay. Any questions so far? Whipping along here. I imagine there are lots of Binghamtonians and potentially a fair number of Trinity people who were part of the ANSCO um, process. Yeah. Um, another hysterical, uh, historical nugget uh, that during that period of time that you mentioned, the U-2 spy planes and using ANSCO film, they had so many spy photographs, they needed a way to quickly categorize them, okay. catalog them. And the folklore that I have heard is that barcode was invented in Clinton Street at ANSCO wow. for the purpose of indexing 
that huge quantity of spy photographs. I there are still people around who could uh, uh, <laughs> verify or deny. <laughs> yeah, I, let me. I will ask the. Uh, they, they still have lunch at uh, Chris's diner once a month. <laughs> I will. I will check. Um, but okay. So, anything else about Ansco? Yes, sir. Well, your presentation has brought back a memory in the nineteen. 50s when I was in grade school in Syracuse there was a kid in my class I don't know if it was in fourth grade or fifth grade that he brought this device to school I guess his dad worked for ANSCO it was the size of a small juice can and it had a little cable that came out of it and he would hold the can up and with his thumbnail he'd run, run it along the cable and go you super ANSCO film <laughs> Just do it from a vibration. I still remember that. Yeah. And he would do it two or three times. You super ansco film. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they have some of the best marketing that I have ever seen. And the daughter of the market, that was Phil Mycota, whose name may or not be familiar. He was in charge of that. Long term volunteers. But my, I almost brought it today, but it's not World War II. When they came up with a high-speed color film that was used in the Cuban War, the marketing was a large matchbook. And it was you know, just enough light and a match to take a picture. And then they calculated there was a light exposure table on the back, and the picture was really great. Um, it's still my it's a class. So we have one. We can show them. <laughs> Come on, stop by. See what we'll do, what we do. Okay, so this is the IBM... This is, I think, going around. Um, this is the uh, brochure for the IBM Endicott plant number one um, award. And what? Okay. Um, in large letters in the middle, it says the Army Navy Production Award for, quote, achieving today what yesterday seemed impossible. Um, and that's really quite a wonderful uh, mantra to go for, uh, for, what, for what they did. Um, IBM won these for a variety of um, items. The first and the largest thing they built was the wait, hold it, um, automatic sequence calculating computer. Uh, and they built it for Harvard and the Navy. Uh, and it, the person who was really in charge of this um, special wireman for IBM. And there he is on the left putting things together. And on the right, um, in his older years, he left um, IBM to the 1950s. Uh, it was a really boring place to work. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at all of those things that he had to hook up, um, if you do miles and miles of that, I can see that <laughs> that could be a little bit of a challenge. But if you want to think of someone, just this is a this is one of the things that he's attaching, and uh, I won't throw that one out. Um, I don't know if it's a bit or <laughs> I'm not quite sure what it does from a computing perspective, um, but it is a it, there are many of them in in this machine, uh, which was used um, by Harvard and the Navy. From that, IBM Endicott went on to become a leading designer of circuits, and that's one of the things made it, it makes it important today. And I'm going to pass this around. This is a, a desk toy from the team of Xbox 360. <laughs> the, undertold, <laughs> the undertold story of this area is that some of the most important chips for video games were designed in Endicott, built in um, Vermont, and in the mid Hudson Valley, but designed here. So it's the brain power of Endicott that make you be able to go beyond a Pong and, and Super Mario Brother into something that's. So this is a, a sample of the chips here. I'll take this. Well, I was going to mention we used a lot of those at the uh, oh. the forum when we were hooking up the uh, organ. <laughs> the relay. Oh, that's a relay. Okay, that is a relay, and. You were telling that they use them when they hooked up the form theater the organ in the Yeah. Exactly. Lots of them. Yes. <laughs> so as we yeah. 
Go ahead. Susan, you mentioned we have and stop by and see. Who are we and where are they? Oh, okay. Um, can can you wait about five minutes? It's the I put that in the last side in case in case somebody asks, but just in case, here we go. <laughs> there you go. And you pass it out. <laughs> we'll put this at the end for some people to take. Okay. Um, TechWorks is at downtown Binghamton, and we showcase the technology of the region, past, present, and future. And our specialty is making things work, which is why we call it TechWorks. Um, that's also apparently the name for a factory. It's a, the works, right? The wire works. So, okay. So, um, this is the letter from the Undersecretary of the War Department thanking um, IBM Endicott for all they did. And on the right-hand side is the acknowledgement, which is, is pretty special, is that they're thanking the officers of the Navy, Army, Air Corps. They're thanking their subcontractors, their suppliers, the residents of the triple cities. They are thanking everyone that they had contact with to be um, having earned having contributed in such large measure to make possible these honors, which are being conferred on, upon the men and women of IBM plant number one. So <laughs> other, they have the long list, just a long list of other things that they claim they, that, that they did. And essentially, IBM turned over all of their manufacturing to, um, to the war effort and built in 1942 the plant in Poughkeepsie, to help that out. So Endicott was, until 1942, Endicott was the only IBM plant that existed. So then they added that. But um, they did naval and aircraft fire control instruments, Browning automatic rifles, uh, director and prediction units for 90 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, bomb sites, and aircraft supercharged impellers. So a wide variety of things. And the last that they, um, uh, and that their IBM accounting machines followed mobile units for the trip for the U.S. Tro troops in battle. Um, and at the end, the war's end, armistice documents are typed on an IBM electric. <laughs> <laughs> we should maybe double check that. <laughs> so, um, so clearly very significant. And the next company we want to take a look at is another major company in Broome County and in Binghamton that did not earn an IBM, an Army Navy award. They built a, uh, this is a pilot maker to train um, pilots to focus on their instruments, not on their, yeah, just toss it here. Carl, oops. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not, I like baseball. I'm not good at it. <laughs> okay. Um, they uh, made 500 of these pilot trainers. I mean, I'm sorry. They made 10,000 pilot trainers and, and trained half a million pilots across um, the U.S., um, U.K., and Canada in World War II. And this is a letter on the left from Hap Arnold, who is the commanding general of the Army Air Forces. And he did not waste time saying thank you. He wrote this letter on Armistice Day and said, uh, this is the day from 7 December 41. The Japs have followed the Germans and surrendered by three months. We all know the conclusive part played by our Army Air Forces in the winning of these victories. And the Army Air Forces appreciates more than, the synthet more than anyone else what you and your employees have done to provide the synthetic training devices with which we were able to operate. And are incorporated magnificently in meeting every change or urgent production schedule. Without your outstanding services, our air plans would, up against these two enemies could never have been accomplished. I salute you and your employees on this first official day of peace and commend you highly for your part if possible. The best of luck to every one of you and the hearty thanks of your Ar Army Air Forces. So that's almost better than a little E pin. <laughs> but um, so that was Hap Arnold. My favorite quote among which, by the way, um, Binghamton University Special Collections in their link collections has a lot of really interesting World War II era information. But 
one of the nicest, most interesting quotes is, the Luftwaffe met its Waterloo on all the training fields of North America. And at every one of those fields in the British Empire, as well as in the United States, there was a battery of link trainers. So let's take a little bit. I think we have some time here. Yeah. There's some time to take how it worked inside. The link trainer, and I wanted to bring a, as much music as possible into this talk. The link trainer comes from a piano and organ company technology. And the story goes that Ed Link was sitting on a bellows of a theater organ and said, this feels like flying. And that inspired him. So he then, you'll see, we can pass this around if you want. He took a part a piano, a, a mechanical piano and an organ, and put it back together to um, create a pneumatic motion system. So this is all motion system with a geared computer that tracks your instrument. So you know what your altitude is, you know what how much fuel you have left. All of that is tracked by this class is the crew. And what I wanted you, we can pass this around if you want, I don't know. But what I goes here as the bottom left is a vacuum turbine which was designed um, by a gentleman in Connecticut who played the organ and his feet got tired Mr. Spencer so he invented a, a turbine to power his organ so he didn't have to spend so much time pumping the organ and this because they were using that uh, the Spencer turbines in their organ. So when they took things apart, they added that. So that's the lower left-hand corner. The lower right-hand corner, wait a second. Ah, here it is. Okay, the lower right-hand corner um, with a vertical arrow is the player piano bellows are making the, the yaw. It's making a turn left and right. So that's the mechanics of doing this. This is all done with pneumatics. It's all done with air. And then this, What's the only thing small enough to bring? <laughs> <laughs> this is what's called a rough air generator. And see here, and we pass it around, see it afterwards. The tubes here are where you connect the air tubes that um, control the bellows that make you get pitch and roll. And the theory is that it's never always smooth sailing. You have to be prepared for emergencies when there's a gl glitch. And so what it does is, and these obviously look like pianos. This goes around here, and every once in a while, it will put a blip in one of these air, air streams. And it was explained to me there, it's not random, but there are six, four options here. And that's like counting cards if they're five suits. <laughs> so that is, they subject it. And I'm up, I'm happy to pass around, but it's probably easier to um, just play with it here. So it's a really remarkable. And of the uh, ten thousand they made, we think there's about two hundred left in the world. So maybe uh, maybe thirty or forty operate, but. Um, Eric, was Eric Yo ever a member of Trinity, or is he a member of Presbyterian? Yes. Okay, well, <laughs> Eric helped us fund uh, a collection of used parts. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, someone was going out of business. We needed used parts to fix our blue box so it would operate. And the person said, "Sorry, going out of business is all or nothing." So Eric uh, figured out some funding, and we ended up with. Um, 25,000 pounds of, of World War II <laughs> um, blue box parts and a couple of extra blue boxes. And <clears throat> yes, and is, we've actually, uh, we sell them and or give them depending we, to people who are restoring link uh, blue boxes for a museum or whatever. And we have more than made up the cost of shipping them from Dayton, Ohio to here. So... Um, <laughs> And we still have shelves and shelves left of some of these. So if you need an instrument for your World War II um, uh, flight pilot trainer, uh, I'll give you a good deal. All right. And I think 
Yes. It was clear. I think it, hopefully, this was clear in all handoff efforts in Broome County and around here to make this happen. And this is a photograph from one of the um, ANSCO sales brochures. <laughs> and I'm wondering if maybe these are Fritz Wallenberg's hands. Um, and I would certainly, Fritz Wallenberg, as many of you know, is a research chemist from Germany, and he brought chamber music and a lot of things to the United, um, to Broome County. And I would certainly like to think that these are the hands of Fritz Johnson. I have, I mean, of Fritz Wallenberg. He started um, the orchestra here, of yeah. course, and um, he became a, a, the chemist because his mother had said, you can't live off of being a musician. <laughs> you have to learn a trade or something. And so he reluctantly did that and yeah. Yeah. worked there. His daughter, Kathy, might be able to identify. Okay. The, uh, hey, if I send you the photograph, could you? Sure. sure. Perfect. Perfect. His wife, Mariana, once took string quartets with Einstein. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think they started. He, said he sucked as a violinist. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a piano. So here we go. <laughs> yeah, actually. Right. Yeah. That's just great. So, okay. So here we are back to Ed Aswad. And we, if you want, we can do another review of all the boring data. Um, but, so that's um, kind of look here and see if I, oh, what I talked about the maps. One of the things we didn't talk about, and you can see, I think you may have seen what's going around, are the silk, yeah, thank you. The silk escape, pilot escape maps. And these are not made here. We just use them because they're part of being a pilot and part of flying. And I think what's really important for people to understand, in, in aviation, you need two things. You need airplanes and you need pilots. <laughs> and you need both. And what we come, we bring, we bring the pilot trainers from Link and the subsequent companies that are doing um, flight pilot training, flight simulation. But also, we, as we saw from General Electric and Remington Rand and Stowe and other places, we've done a, an avionics, IBM's avionics of um, post-World War II have been huge. We do both here, which is really remarkable if you think about it. So um, that's why I wanted to leave it with um, a personal, uh, Ed Aswad's perspective. And I've, I'll answer your question about who are we and what we do, but let's see if there are any other questions that you have about <coughs> this. No, no questions. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> well, I was going to say it's not World War II, but I worked for the Raymond Corporation for many years. And with the advent of the nuclear submarine, you needed logistics. Yeah. And Raymond Corporation still to this day holds the contract for being able to provide a forklift truck that does not give off any type of a spark. Because in a nuclear sub, when you are moving those armaments, you can't have that happen. So again, the technology just 20 miles up the road to develop the type of machine that would be spark free right. yeah yeah so that's yeah. one of their contribution to logistics mm -hmm. in the nuclear age and today um even today as people talk more and more about fuel cells yeah. raymond was way way ahead of the game on fuel cell and fuel cell research um but the company chose not to follow that for a time but it's said, although the Raymond people don't want you to say this, <laughs> is that one of the reasons Toyota bought Raymond was because they wanted access to the intellectual property rights and the scientists who, who did that. And I'm having a, drawing a blank right now, but I think the gentleman who was in charge could have been Trinity. He certainly lived on the west side of Binghamton. Yes. Yeah and, and, yeah, yeah, and George lived on Riverside Drive. Yeah. But I don't think he was trying. No. There's somebody else, a, a more recent person who retired about five or ten years ago. Oh, Paul, I want to think is his first name. But anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, that's really important how to and, do and that. And you're, you're correct. Um, the story with George Raymond was he did not like Toyota. 
sell to Toyota. <laughs> but he made a second generation truck for Jan Heinrich in Germany and BT Sweden and Toyota. Mm -hmm. So we ended up being told, sold to BT Sweden, who three years later, Toyota bought BT Sweden specifically to get to Raymond mm -hmm. because they want one of the packs. Right. Well, yeah. and today there, there's a big infrastructure movement now about what to do about alternative energies and fuel cells is becoming, I wouldn't say a competitor to lithium ion batteries, but they're working on it. <laughs> they're still, um, yeah. The university and Raymond have a joint partnership right. to develop work on that. And the president of Raymond is a BU graduate. <laughs> and Binghamton native. <laughs> he may be a Binghamton High School graduate. I'm not <laughs> sure about that. And that would be going over. Yes, John. Yeah. So, so do you, are other researchers in the area have explanations for why the Binghamton area is so successful? Why it was what? Why Binghamton area was so successful <laughs> oh. in all of these different uh, ventures. <laughs> Did I tell you, before you got here, I was telling you, you were a really good um, uh, diplomat. Uh, that's about what I'm about to say. <laughs> The answer is no, but yes, no, but. <laughs> okay, so let's go here. So um, I'll get to that in two seconds. <laughs> um, museums start in several ways. It's just the nature of the museum world. You can either start with a collection, and then you build a building around it, and Oops, sorry, you don't do that. Um, you either start with a building, like Robertson did, and then you fill it up, or you can start with an idea. And the International Spy Museum in um, Washington, D.C. started that way, and their mantra is spy stuff is cooler than regular stuff. And in a, in a city where there are an enormous number of choices for museums, they charge $20 a day, and people up around the building come and see it because they're so cool. So... That's sort of the approach. We are taking the approach that's a subset of that, which is a question. We started with a question. How do so few people invent so much? Exactly the question is, why is that happening? Um, and um, so part of that, we've been doing oral histories um, since, for, wait, since 2003. Um, we've been talking to people. We've been listening to people. I think it's not clear there's one answer. There are many answers. My favorite explanation is that uh, we are remarkably close from factory and farm because before GPS and internet, if you're a, a farmer, you have to be an engineer. You have to at least be an inventor because when your tractor gets stuck, um, if your tractor gets stuck two miles away, your only way home is to fix the with what's in the back of your tractor, or you walk home and walk back. So you really have to be a problem solver to be an effective farmer. And what's remarkable is that we are in an area where there's lots of small farms, whether they're dairy farms or, or other farms, and they IBM in particular hires lots and lots of people with an agricultural background. I don't know about the other companies as much. We haven't interviewed quite so many of them, but that I think is... That's a pl uh, something that appears plausible. The one is location. If you look in the train, train was important. Binghamton was a hub, and you could get your product to market 300 miles in any direction in less than a day. So for people like um, Azon, which did coding paper for architects, they could call up at four in the afternoon and say, we need Prints out or, and it's due tomorrow. <laughs> so they would start printing it, they'd get it on the truck, and it would be in Manhattan by 7 a.m. the next day. So that was really doable. And if you look at the map also, if you're on the coast, you lose a big chunk of your diameter. <laughs> it's in the ocean. <laughs> Think about it. New York City, you want to go east <laughs> or southeast, you're going to end up in, you know, stat, you know, in the in the river. So there's a it's an easy commute. And Azon had a plan that they would set, they would build their plants no more than 500 miles apart. So they laid out a map of the United States and put it because they wanted to be within a day of a, a, a day's drive of a market. So that was important. Before that, it was the, the, the railroads that were important. We were a serious hub. 
um, with aircraft, air transportation, that's made a little difference. But I think so those are a couple of the reasons for that. Um, but I also think there's a personality piece of it. Um, and that is, if you particularly if you talk to the ANSCO chemists, <laughs> who are just so much, and you talk to them, they go, wow, this is really cool. Seriously, it's just tidbits. It's just tidbits. We didn't do anything important. We just did tidbits. And in fact, they advanced things that Kodak could never do. And they did it. And they, their absence of ego, they're willing to talk to anyone. The ANSCO chemists also say if they had a problem, they could go down into the cafeteria and look around <laughs> and there would be someone there who knew how to solve that problem. So it was small enough and talented enough that they, they could do that. And they would encourage that, um, encourage that kind of problem solving. So I, I but I don't think that's a, a good answer, but I think it's a, it's a partial answer. It's like a nuclear chain reaction. Once it gets going, it attracts. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And it keeps right. <laughs> right. Well, it, we have an advantage that uh, Silicon Valley does not have is that we do have a lot of really good recreational skiing, boating, swimming, you know, a lot of really, they have it in California, but they've got to drive a lot of piles and it's really hot and it's really expensive. And now that part of the, you know, it's going to fall off the, the, <laughs> fall off the map. So, so, but yeah, so it's, um, At one point, there are, it's, um, it's not mentioned, in, I didn't mention here, there, in 1959, IBM, and it, it, IBM or say it was the most uh, revenue generating machine they ever built. In an era when 300 was a good number, they had orders for 10,000. And that's those orders that generated universal instruments to get into the business of automatic Component insertion because the ladies couldn't keep up. So, um, but they're only of those ten thousand. They're only uh, at that time. There are only three, three or four organizations that have these and are trying to make them work. So we had just gotten one, and we thought it would be a good idea to get everybody together and talk about it and kind of share ideas and and help. And my pitch to them in California and Seattle was, "Yeah, to come to Binghamton." We're near one country. <laughs> the phone, Susan, we're in one country. <laughs> so that was not my best marketing strategy, but they did come. So they did show up and they did, so they did help. But in our case, and that may be the Computer History Museum, which has way, way much more money than anybody, you know, don't ask. Um, they have two of these machines and it's taking them 20 years to get them working. We had one of those machines and it's taken us less time to get it working, maybe three or four. And part of the reason is the people in California, they're the working guys, you know, there's the person you take your Ferrari to when it, you know, you need a new something. Here is where it was designed, built, and programmed. So ours are the creators. And so it turns out it's a really nice and positive you know, synergy. We help each other, you know, they've got it, they need an idea, we've got it. So, um, but yeah, it's fascinating. So I think part of that is that we've kept creative here. And there may be one more possible explanation. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's plenty more, but one that I can think of. Um, Corning has a mantra that says, if you can't make it, you can't sell it. And so high precision manufacturing has been a tradition here for decades and generations. And it started in part with people coming to make shoes and start with people coming to metal, precision metal work. There's been a long-term you know, tradition of that. And Cigars. What? Cigars. <laughs> yeah. 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 High precision. Yeah. High precision. <laughs> so... Um, being able to make things maybe um, because we have so many people who can actually make things, could actually make things until the 1990s, um, that you're able to go quickly from idea to prototype to product. Um, and both, is that true? Okay. IBM, 
you can design a product ever anywhere you until the 1990s. You could design something anywhere you wanted in IBM, but you could not put it into production until it had come to Endicott and been reviewed and re approved by the manufacturing and engineering department. So that was IBM's way of figuring out: can you make it? You know, can you make it? And so, so. Um, that's that. So, um, so just really quickly to finish your, this is the earlier question I was getting around to. Um, this is what we have done. I don't know if you can read this. This is our, um, the first 25 years, uh, this is before the early 2000s. Um, but we spent five years listening and planning. We spent five resources collecting things, sort of like the kinds of things you have. Um, we've spent another five years preparing artifacts in action. So then when you come to TechWorks, you can see that mainframe work. You can print a selfie with all letters using a 1960s printer, with a System 360 printer, uh, pre-digital. You we Then we activate and we test these visitors. And then we make them work. And then we let people try them out. And, and we try to figure out how to get better. So that when you come to TechWorks, it's fun. And it's not just looking at things. It's how does it work and why is it important? Those are the two questions we think are more important than who, what, when, where. And also, I'm not very good at those first three. So, but, but how it works, because if you um, think about the link trainer story, when we tell, we let people see their analytics, the flight and we talk to them and we suggest to them that they can use that technology to invent something completely different or they can take that flight trainer and find another technology to apply to it so it can go both ways and that's what we're trying to encourage people to do um, with various things so you guys should all come down and visit and we have handouts and i think that might oh yeah, so our next phase that we're embarking on now is developing a new facility, a gallery facility. So our current location would remain as a warehouse and a workshop and offices, but it's not suitable for people. I mean, nice people. I mean, I can go, but, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so it's not what you would call museum quality. Let's put it that way. You guys are going to... I'm not sure we're going to be able to record it. Okay. So TechWorks Next Gen is slated as galleries. This is from Central New York, a 30,000 square foot, one story building. And the three criteria for location, and I would tell you what it is, but I can't, um, is that it needs to be near to the bus station. And that's because the under resourced teenagers in Broome County deserve as much access to technology and the, the these really remarkable volunteers as the rich kids from the suburbs who have cars. I mean, everybody deserves to have that kind of access um, and learn that. Same thing with BU and SUNY Broom. We um, operate at least one capstone project a year and have since 2006. We have hundreds of um, students come. We need to be close because what we find is that the veterans have the wisdom that students have the energy <laughs> and the enthusiasm. And together, it's just a really potent um, a bill, a product to be able to do um, things. And then the third, we'd like to be near the hotels for visitors to come and make it easy for visitors to come. So, so that's what we're looking at. And there are some plans for funding, but I forget about that <laughs> call me in four years you know? so anyway so but it it goes <coughs> from the fundamental this is a map that i can have for you to pass out uh, i can pass out for you we looked at this 10 years ago for the city for brownfield um study and these are all of the things that were invented within a half mile of downtown and if you think about it the bundy time clocks come up uh Link organs become flight simulation. Uh, where are we? Um, Lester Linsler had one. Uh, Macintosh amps powered Woodstock and the Grateful Dead. They're from across the street from us. 
the first electric trolley in New York State, my favorite, Stowe Manufacturing, the first flexible shaft, um, Phillips Foundry Universal Instruments, um, the world's first land-based communication, mobile communication was done here. And that stems from teletypes. In the 1840s, you could teletype from one station to another. It wasn't until 1917 you could go from a moving train to a station. And that was done by the, the uh, train company that was here with the help of uh, Sarnoff and uh, Marconi were as subcontractors. So that's here. That, that's, that's big, you know. And the tower is still up by the baseball stadium. Um, and then, what am I missing? The um, it, Riverdale played, the bingo played the first integrated baseball before the Negro Leagues. So we have a long tradition of a variety of things here. So, so, but then again, the question is, how do so few people create so much? And there's a lot of answers to that. And we're always interested in getting listening to other people's theories about how that works. Um, the one guy, one of the very few mechanical engineers who ever became an IBM fellow, and he became a fellow because, among other things, he put the first magnetic stripe on a plastic card to be a key. <laughs> he invented the uh, dot matrix printer and did the heart lung machine. <laughs> so, remarkable guy <laughs> from Rochester. He said, I liked working at IBM because my entire time I worked there, which is 40 plus years, I was always my own boss. And I could, def the projects were defined that I could, project. I could wrap my arms around the whole project. I wasn't a small piece of something giant. My piece was well-defined and I could do it and run with it. And that's an interesting way of managing um, engineering and invention and manufacturing. So, so. okay. Yes, sir. You mentioned IBM and, of course, computers and computer programming. Uh, a very critical part of writing computer programs to this day, which really kind of revolutionized the whole concept of computer. Oh, programs. so we need to uh, get him to uh, do a little oral history, sit down and put that. Do you want to in do the interview? <laughs> I, I, he's, I'll give you a me some literature on the subject historically. Yeah, okay. So I'm so we have um, oral history recording devices that we're willing to share and willing to train people to do this because without the stories, this is just stuff, you know, <laughs> acid fixer. <laughs> but um, you really need the stories to make and make it understand, to make it vital, and to be able to push us forward. The the the, the goal here is to. Make sure this next we, we make sure this next generation has an opportunity to do the kinds of things that their great grandparents did. The talent started offshoring. We've lost a generation or two of these high precision manufacturers, and it's going to take a lot of work to get them back. It's going to take, a, and they can't. You just can't three. <laughs> Maybe you could. I could. <laughs> um, so seriously, that's really part of it is to get people thinking about that and doing that. Um, yeah. You don't do but I want to say that Janet Yellen <laughs> is going to make it possible for that to happen. So in front of the um, global tax rates for companies and um, com countries like Ireland, for example, show up tax rates to attract industry. So the attract industry and the bottom lines of the companies look great, but they've left their employees behind. And so that's really been a challenge and they've been working on that globally, but also with the United States for more than 20 years. And it takes a short lady from Brooklyn <laughs> to figure it out. And she has, negotiated and they have signed and approved a standard minimum corporate tax um, for uh, globally. So that's a, that's a real chance to bring people back. Because again, if you can't make it, 
you can't sell it. And, and over there, that those I, I through. Then there's a fuel cell story that I have to tell. Okay, so um, with a Raymond forklift, it's a very large lead acid battery, and that is the counterweight for when you go up the batteries. <laughs> so when you do fuel cells, they're a lot lighter, and they're in two parts. And apparently, the team the teams weren't talking. Okay, so the first fuel cell uh, forklift that Raymond ever did completely collapsed because it didn't have the weight of the battery to hold it down. <laughs> so you need to have that communication among within your company and within the generations. And I, I'm, I'm afraid we've lost. I know we've lost a lot of that. Whether or not we can bring it back, or depends on some people's brains and 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 collecting stories. Yeah, so that I, yeah. it is true. <laughs> Paul McCreary, I think. Yes. Okay. Just a little bit more. Yes. So Paul McCreary was head of research for fuel cells at um, Raymond. He retired. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. When you were looking at, again, uh, Raymond, because it is a global operation. Uh, in the United States, we're so we build flat, so our warehouses are maybe two, three stories. When you go over to the east, or you're in Europe, their their warehouses are very compact. So, in the they were developing a forklift truck. So this is what they called a man or a person operated forklift truck that would go up nine stories that was specific for those European and Far East markets. So now we had to look into, so if you're putting a man up nine stories, you've got to offset that counterweight. Um, so that was a lot of that. But to go to the fuel cell, mm -hmm. they weren't talking. Yeah. So yeah. put the guy up nine stories, but you can't <laughs> use the hydrogen fuel cell because it's just not going to work. <laughs> and you tried to get him up 10 feet and fell over. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but one thing that actually rang in and, and I, um, my uh, flight simulation people are the ultimate renaissance men in terms of technology and putting things together from all that but i'm getting to think that the raymond people are as well they're really really good at this stuff and they have now integrated this with i warehouse yes. warehouse i warehouse i warehouse i warehouse so that you can pick this up it instantly goes into the computer that is no longer there it takes you to where it's supposed to go it sends it to the vendor or whatever and that is Raymond was a part of that as well, because that was the beginning of my warehouse, that when you're picking, you've got a, a warehouse and say you're the auto manufacturer and your warehouse is all automotive parts. Everything was scanned in the office, downloaded into the truck. The operator would drive down and they would just scan and it would automatically load product into the um, order picker that would take it to the end of yeah. the aisle. Yeah. Kind of thing. So again, that was Raymond technology. That was the first use of RFID technology. Oh, I did not really. Yeah. Yeah. With the wow. House. Yeah. So that was why Toyota wanted us. Yeah. They wanted us so bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again. <laughs> Because I lived in Green for, or I was in the Green community for about 30 years. You look at how our manufacturing plants have changed over the years, or they have reinvented themselves. In Green, you had a company called the Nigerian Hat Factory. Oh, right, 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 right. And Nigerian made all of the hat or all of the ribbons. The late, it's a ribbon factory. Hats. Yes, yes. And then they went on to ribbons that women would buy for sewing purposes. Um, but men don't wear hats anymore. So what they have done in the last 15 years is they have retooled themselves. So now they make all of the reflective 
ribbons and things that you see all of the emergency personnel on lease, the firemen. So you've taken a small manufacturing plant, it's repurposed itself, and it still is viable to the third century. So you've got ramp, and you've got page C, which started, all three started in the 1800s, and they now, each one is still strong into its third century yeah. of operation by retooling and adapting as yeah. the market has kind of pushed right. them and with forward thinking. Mm -hmm. And this was a great and I mean, I'm going to get the timing in just a minute. I have no idea. But anyway, we um, helped them pick um, green and as as one of the topics. And so it's going around. It's an, a small exhibit, smaller here than this room. You can put it in a library lobby. You can put whatever. It's going around the country for five years. Um, and it includes um, green, I'm not sure, green Raymond. And, and yes, and um, yes, Chobani and um, yep. But my favorite part of that is one of the reasons I really liked it is the uh, forklift people um, have some annual events called forklift rodeos. <laughs> so each company comes in with a team yep. and challenges where you have to go how fast you can go and uh, what you can pick up and not drop. And, and, <laughs> and they're and just the videos of them are hysterical. So that was very I worked at Raymond. That was my job. We have never compiled, <laughs> well, no, we've never compiled from history of the company. Okay. And because so many of the original engineers were still alive, I got to interview all of them. Excellent. And we collected all of that original documentation, the service manuals, all of that. We collect all of that it because there are still Raymond trucks that were built in the 60s and 70s that are operational that service tech to be able to work for and to figure out how to use them. So, yeah, so I, I kind of allow yeah. Our 1930s lift is operational if we can charge yes. the battery. We can't find a battery charger for the so anyway, that's a, Raymond doesn't have one. No, yeah, they, gave us, they, they gave us this machine. Anyway, so yeah. it's way past time. But I want to thank everyone for your attention and for your questions. <laughs>